When the snow melted and the tundra turned green around Point Hope, Alaska, Mabel Jewell and her family would pick berries. The mosquitoes would always find them. Mabel found she was spending most of her time brushing them away and could not concentrate on the salmon berries and blackberries waiting to be picked. Her mother said, Mabel, whistle for the wind. <whistles> Mabel whistled. A sudden breeze swept around the tundra. The mosquitoes vanished. That night, Mabel and her family had a feast of dried ugruk, seal oil, and delicious salmon berries. Hello, I'm Jeannie Green. Welcome to Whistle for the Wind. Have you thought that chewing tobacco is safer than smoking? Think again. Chew is addictive. One can has the same amount of nicotine as 60 cigarettes. Rotting teeth and gums, mouth and throat cancer, tooth loss, high blood pressure, and stroke are just a few of the many dangers of chewed tobacco. Set an example and decide to quit now. It's not easy, but you can get help. For more information, call 1-800-LUNG-USA. This message brought to you by the members of the Alaska Tobacco Control Alliance. This week, we heard from first graders in Pensacola, Florida. Randy Thomas, six years old, says, I like to draw kayaks, the Eskimo boat. How do the Eskimos not tip over? Randy, thanks for writing. Actually, the kayak is skillfully made. The Eskimos of the North, called Inupia, created the kayak and perfected it over time. In fact, it's so well made that it almost becomes an extension of the kayaker's body. In ancient times, Eskimos believed their kayaks wouldn't capsize if they carried an ivory doll with them. You might find it interesting, Randy, that the Aleut people also have a canoe called a badarka. Years ago, young boys would exercise their legs every single day by sitting with them straight out so that when they grew older, they could sit in their badarkas for hours with no problem. Randy, please write again. We hope you'll teach us something about the Seminole tribe in Florida. Another letter from the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin. Cindy Pretty on top wonders why some Alaska towns have some funny names like chicken. Cindy, there are actually two towns in Alaska with bird names, Chicken and Pelican. Years ago, they were going to name Chicken Ptarmigan, which is another bird that lives in Alaska. They said no one would be able to pronounce or spell it, so they named it Chicken. <laughs> Alaska has many communities with native names. Some are even spelled the same forward and backward, like Kanekanek, Kayak, Kamek, Kak, and Kijik. One community, Fort Yukon, Alaska, is easy to spell. This Athabascan village in interior Alaska is located on the Yukon River, one of the largest rivers in the world, and the people there are the Gwich'in. A year ago, their school burned to the ground, but last month, the students celebrated the opening of their brand new school. The students dance for the dignitaries and the audience, sharing their joy and their culture. And they have reason to celebrate. It took a year to get their new school. And while they were waiting for it to be built, they went to class in the church and the museum. Everywhere, anywhere, there was space. Traveling to Taos, New Mexico. Students have an opportunity to take an unusual arts class. They learn their traditional Navajo art as well as contemporary art. When student Jason Brown got in trouble in school, his teacher sent him to the Auna Art Center. He says it helped him a lot. I got I got trouble in school, and then my teacher just sent me here. You know, I got I got interested in making jewelry. For I like it. I like to make jewelry. It's, it's neat. And now it's time for our story. Let's all gather round. Today's story is called Swimmer by Shelley Gill and published by Paws for Publishing in Homer, Alaska. The story takes place along the Yukon River we mentioned earlier, the fifth largest river in North America. 
For the 10 to 15,000 native Alaskans who live along its shores, salmon fish are very important. Each species is used for food. Salmon are eaten fresh, smoked, dried, salted, and canned. And dried king salmon skins are used to make the soles of native boots called mukluks. Settle in now for an exciting story about an Athabascan Indian girl and the journey of an Alaskan salmon called Swimmer. In the fading glow of the midnight sun, Katya watched the net, waiting for the telltale jerking motion. This was her sixth year at fish camp. And just as she knew leaves fell from the trees each autumn, she knew the salmon would soon return from the sea. She knew because her grandmother told her stories of the great Chinook, king of all salmon. She knew because she remembered the prayer her grandmother had taught her. Oh, swimmers, thank you for coming to us, Katya whispered, cutting the long shape of the salmon in the sand with an ivory knife. Swimmer, we honor you. It was an ancient prayer of thanks to the fish that had fed her people for thousands of years. Katya imagined she was a sleek salmon gliding through the icy waters of the Bering Sea, swimming in deep places surrounded by shadow creatures, rising to dance beneath the northern lights. But time is a circle, the girl knew. One day, a gleaming silver, the Chinook, soon grows old. Their skin turns red, the splash from their leaping, a fitful death song. When they return from the sea, only one task remain. They must lay their eggs in the river. It all happened in the river, birth and death, beginning and end. In the beginning, the bright red leaves from the blueberry bushes spilled across the tundra. Above the tree line, the ground was bright with snow. At dawn, a skim of ice clung to the rocks that dotted Caribou Creek. Just beneath the twisted limb of an old birch, deep in the river gravel, lay thousands of orange eggs and underwater nursery. As the days grew shorter and colder, the world around the nest grew white and silent. Winter deepened and the eggs began to change color, first to deep orange, then pale apricot. A day came in February when a shadow moved inside one of the eggs. Before long they began to hatch. Swimmer was born. Not much bigger than a budding willow leaf, Swimmer was nourished from the pouch of food she carried on her belly. When the spring ice began to creak and groan, the small salmon wiggled from the safety of her nest. Now she began to hunt, and no longer hidden, she became the hunted. Above the frozen ice, otters scampered and moose foraged. Beneath the ice, Swimmer fought for her life. Grayling darted through the shallows, feasting on baby salmon. As the ice melted, Predators from the sky joined the hunt. Swimmer hid in the river's dark bends, and as the days grew longer, she sank deeper into a shadow world, eating insect larvae, hiding in the rocks. As the brown spring gave way to summer green, Swimmer grew. She would spend two years in fresh water before leaving on a great journey to the salty water of the sea. Her skin grew silver scales as she began to move to deep water, hunting by night, hiding by day. She was surrounded by thousands of other salmon, all of them feeding, many of them becoming food. Swimmer was lucky. She survived drifting down the creek until she reached the big water, the great muddy Yukon, her highway to the sea. Each night, Swimmer and the other salmon sought safety along the murky edges of the muddy Yukon. 
Their watery world was swift and thick, with chunks of spring ice heaving above them. Pike, sheafish, and burbot gobbled them up. Thousands died, but swimmers survived. Summer was near, and soon fishing nets would reach into the river, set to catch the big salmon returning from the sea. Beyond the wide river was the delta, and here swimmer lingered. She sensed a change in the motion of the water, a first taste of salt in the tide. She fed on rich clouds of tiny marine creatures and shrimp that floated in the shallow waters. She grew bigger and stronger, and then one day she was there in the boundless sea that had called to her since birth. Join us next week for part two of Swimmer and find out what happens when Swimmer gets chased by an orca whale. Also. Next week, we visit the children in Ruby, Alaska. Until then, I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining me, and please remember to write to us. Have a wonderful week, and remember, every problem has an answer. If nothing else, whistle for the wind. We have the responsibility to teach many traditions and skills to our children, things like hunting, fishing, and language. There is one thing, though, that we must not pass on, and that's chew tobacco. It's addictive. One can of snuff has as much nicotine as sixty cigarettes, and tooth loss, mouth and throat cancer, high blood pressure, and stroke are just a few of the many dangers of chewed tobacco. Nearly ninety percent of all new tobacco users are children and teens who follow the example of family members who chew. Please return to a healthy tradition and decide to quit today. It may be hard, but there is help, and your example can help save the next generation. For more information, call one eight hundred Lung USA. This message brought to you by the members of the Alaska Tobacco Control Alliance. Hi, this is Jeannie Green with some thoughts on my new Native American children's program, Whistle for the Wind. Western education has historically ignored or glossed over Native America when teaching our country's children. My mission with Whistle for the Wind is to give a voice to the Native youth of Alaska and America, and inform children everywhere about the planet's diverse Native cultures and their important place in the world. I'll be calling on children from around Alaska and the Lower Forty Eight to tell about their lives and their people's ways. We'll be sharing our biggest dreams, funniest jokes, and our most inspiring stories. We invite all kids, parents, and teachers, all tribes, to circle the drum, or as we Anupiat say, join the invitational dance. That's when it's most fun to see all tribes gathering to the beat of the drum. Together, we'll whistle for the wind. <laughs>